Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles podcast, a bi-weekly show which is called Things We Said Today. This is a program where we discuss anything that has to do with the Beatles' careers, their years together, solo years, their music, their history, whatever comes to mind, sometimes what's going on in the news. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. You might know me for a few other Beatles programs that I host or co-host. Uh, a syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing. Also a solo Beatles uh, video podcast show now called Talk More Talk. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts of this show. First of all, a man that you've heard on the radio, if you live in the New York area, for the past 35 years, who's been doing an excellent job at WFUV, not only doing his shows, but great interviews on the air, even Beatles specials, too like a Beatles Christmas special from last that's year. That's right. You might have caught. And that's our own Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hello, everyone. How are you? Happy Thanksgiving and happy holidays and happy White Album. And and thanks for, uh, thanks for listening and great to be on board. Yep. And we also have our other co-host who's been with us now for about four, maybe five years, I think it might be. But... Um, he worked for many years at the New York Times, writing in their classical department. He's written for Beatle Fan Magazine, and he's also written a number of Beatle books, including From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And he's a freelance writer right now. You'll find many of his articles online on the Beatles. His name is Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken, and hello, everyone. On today's show, we're going to be reviewing the brand new, long-awaited White Album box set that just came out to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' double album. And before we get to that, as we try to do here in most of our shows, we have a few news items to get to. And um, I want to make sure I bring up that uh, one of the major news items is that uh, last week, Ringo Starr announced that he'll be touring once again with his all-star band and will also be hitting the United States. And this will be talk about anniversaries here. The 30th anniversary next year of the all-star band. Wow. Hard to believe. It feels like yesterday. (laughs) It really does. And um, the big change in the all-star band lineup is that very quickly, it seems Graham Goldman is out of the band. That was a short stint. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, back into the band is Hamish Stewart, known for his years in the Average White Band and also for playing in Paul McCartney's band mm-hmm. during the Flowers and the Dirt off the ground period and those two tours, those two world tours. And so uh, I, I know that um, Ringo will be playing in Japan with this lineup for nine concert dates from March 27th through April 11th. The U.S. tour for Ringo will actually start August 1st, and it will end September the 1st. And the full itinerary of the tour will be revealed soon. Uh, You can always check Ringo's website, which is RingoStar.com. Also, we've been talking about Ringo's brand new book of photos called Another Day in the Life. His follow-up to his previous book of photos, his own personal photos that he took himself, called Photograph. The new book is called Another Day in the Life. And it's from Genesis Publications, and there'll be a limited edition. Uh, I believe it's already been released. And there'll also be a mass market release of this book coming next April. Nice. All right. So uh, I love the photos and photograph. So this will be more of the same. I was so happy to hear that news about another tour. And, uh, you know, bless him. He's... uh, no slowing down Ringo. He just posted a photo today of him on the way to the gym to work out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, he's 78 years old and he's in great shape. And you can tell when you see him on stage mm-hmm. you how know, widely th- he is. I was thinking that, uh, you know, we, we, we have um, the White Album box set. Imagine just came out. Got the McCartney and Wings box sets coming. You know, we'll be talking a lot, I'm sure next year about what might come for the 50th anniversary of abbey road what could be uh, coming for let it be 
Uh, and I'm thinking, well, we got the 30th anniversary of the All-Star Band. I've always felt that there should be an All-Star Band, I don't know if I'd say box set, but multi-disc set, similar to what came out, I don't know how many years ago, So Far, I think, was the right. name of it. Yeah. The So Far anthology of the All-Star Band. Uh, I think now would be a good time in 2019 for the 30th anniversary of a complete comprehensive All-Star Band set. Or uh, how about getting some of Ringo's albums reissued as part of uh, remixed, uh, maybe not remixed, remastered and reissued. So maybe that could happen next year for the 30th anniversary of, uh, of the All Star Band. You know, when we started talking about the Imagine Box set and then we were kind of hoping that this might be a springboard for other similar sets of John Solo music, you can certainly apply that to Georgia's solo catalog and to Ringo's solo catalog. Right. And maybe something could be done. I don't know if it would be as extensive as what Yoko just did. But, uh, you know, it's funny that you're, you're saying this because as I'm listening to this White Album box set and one of the, the many highlights is this one disc of the Isher demos, I was just thinking about the bootleg of Beware of Abco, which has got all the songs or many right. of the songs from All Things Must Pass of George doing it on acoustic guitar, and he gave that to Phil Spector so he can know the songs. Wouldn't it be cool to have an All Things Must Pass box set and have that disc in there? You know? Oh, yeah. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Our imaginations run wild. <laughs> yeah, and you know, around think the... of the possibilities of what could come out, you know? <laughs> and around the time folks are listening to this, uh, we'll hit the 48th anniversary of All Things Must Pass's release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, other news, last week we also saw the passing of Stan Lee. And um, I don't know if you guys saw this or not, but Paul McCartney actually had a nice tribute to him online that he posted on his website. And I'm just going to read this because it was a surprise to me what he had to say. He says, I was lucky enough to meet him. He came over to my office and we sat around for a while chatting about comic books and my admiration for his work. Actually, he was suggesting making a superhero who would wield a Hofner bass guitar. Hmm. The guitar the guitar would have superpowers, <laughs> and we spent some time imagining what those could be. He had a great sense of humor, and I must say the idea of becoming a, a guitar-wielding superhero in one of his comic books was very appealing. Sending love to his family and friends and always holding happy memories of this great man. Love you, Stan, from Paul. And I was surprised to read this because we heard many years ago, this is going back maybe to the year 2000, 2001, Ringo was talking to Stan Lee about creating a superhero character based on Ringo's persona. I never knew that Stan Lee was talking to Paul. Did either of you guys hear about this before this? I don't think so. No, I didn't. I saw the, uh, the tribute that you just read. I didn't know about Paul being being on Stan Stan Lee's mind. Uh, but the Ringo thing, I do remember when that came about, it just never developed. Was it 10 years now? Has it been about 10 years, maybe, since we first heard about Ringo, the superhero? or I, think it's, just, I think it's much longer than that. Yeah? It, yeah. Well, uh, and, and it just never, there was never a follow-up on that. No. So for both Paul and Ringo, nothing did materialize. But interesting that they both talked to him about creating characters like this. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> also, since we're at the symposium, Mark uh, Lapidos was there from the Fest for Beatle fans, and he had a new program to show us. So for those of us who are wondering who the guest might be for the upcoming Fest for Beatle fans, it is listed here in the program. And Jack Douglas will be a special guest. Nice that he is returning. Uh, Denny Lane, Lawrence Juber, Alan White from Yes, who of course worked with John on the Imagine album and uh, Instant Karma as well, Mark Rivera, and Jack Oliver will be returning uh, general manager of Apple Records. So that's going to be the weekend of March the 29th through the 31st, and that will be at the Hyatt Regency on the Hudson in New York City. I can't right. wait. This is I was so excited to see this lineup of guests. For my personal tastes, this is the best lineup that they've had in many a year. It's always fun to have Denny Lane and Lawrence Juber back, oh, even if it's just one of them. But it's always sweet to have uh, more than one member of Wings uh, around. 
And, you know, getting I had the honor of um, interviewing Jack Oliver at the Beatle Fest, I think, 2015, the mm-hmm. New York, the New York, New Jersey Metro Fest, not the Chicago one. But uh, that was the first of the two years where the fest was held in Westchester County. And uh, I interviewed Jack Oliver and it was a fascinating uh, half hour. And I'm happy he's back. And Alan White, I mean, I'm a big Yes fan. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be great to to have uh, Alan White there. And I just recently, a couple of months ago, bought a copy uh, of uh, Alan's solo album, uh, Ramshackled, uh, which was in nice condition. So I'm looking forward to getting that autographed. Uh, so the fest is going to be great this year, coming up at the end of the last weekend in March in Jersey City. That's right. We'll both be there. I uh, hope that, Alan, you can make it, I hope. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you we're talking about superheroes, and then you mentioned Mark Lapido. So I was going to say, well, you know, Mark would be a, a great superhero <laughs> if, uh, you know, we could turn Mark Lapido into a, 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 a superhero comic book character. We'll have to find out if Mark ever spoke to Stan Lee about it. <laughs> He'd be the man <laughs> to do it. And also, finally, since we're about to talk about the White Album, um, we're happy to announce that it has debuted on the Billboard album charts in the top ten at number six. Yeah. So um, this past year, Egypt Station, Paul McCartney's new album, debuted at number one. The White Album debuts at number six. Some mighty good showings right there for this year for Beatles fans. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that I, I don't pretend to understand the the Billboard charts anymore. I used to when I was younger, and I would follow them much more religiously. Mm-hmm. But I would have automatically thought that the White Album would have come out like and ended up on a catalog chart, not yep. as one of the you know the main top two hundred album listing. But uh, so I wasn't even anticipating uh, people talking about it being a top ten album once again. I saw the article. I, I don't have it in front of me, but I think the last time it was in the top 10 was something like March of 1969. Right. When it last, I think, was at number five, and then it dropped out of the top 10, something like that. Mm-hmm. Spent 10, something like 10 non consecutive weeks at number one. So, and here we are 50 years later, and it's back in the top 10. That's very cool. I don't know the full logic of why it's on the top 200 charts as opposed to the catalog charts. I always thought if if a catalog item re-enters, it would be only if it's the exact same item. If it's maybe. repackaged like this, it's made out to be a new release. Mm-hmm. So maybe. Maybe, it, maybe that's the consideration here. I'm not sure mm-hmm. if anybody else knows that can write into us. But um, one more thing before we talk about the White Album is the symposium, the White Album symposium that we attended uh, last week at Monmouth University, and um, this happened all weekend long. In fact, I think it even started on Thursday. Yep. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. There, and, there were even some events earlier than Thursday, but they were just like tours of Asbury Park and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, Thursday is when it really got going. Right. And uh, there were panel discussions held throughout the weekend, and so many of them, and it's almost kind of lo- like the fest for Beatle fans for me because there's so much going on all at the same time, and you wanna you wanna see all of it. <laughs> I wish everything was recorded and released like on DVD, but uh, that's the frustrating thing about dealing with some of these events. There was there were times when there were eight panels going on at the same time. Right. And um, and so many of the people who are in these panels are people that that I know personally or I've interviewed and I want to meet. And you can only do so much. That's right. Uh, but we had a panel on Saturday, and uh, we want to thank everybody listening who attended the symposium and saw our panel. It was all about the White Album and whether or not we felt it was the Beatles at their creative peak or past their peak. And I think we had a really great conversation, and the audience chimed in with a lot of good questions and observations. So how did you guys feel about our panel? I was uh, thrilled, actually, on a personal standpoint, something that uh, the folks who were there and the uh, folks who listened to our last show, which actually was uh, uh, kind of a condensed version of the panel, the last things we said today uh, show was from the symposium. But on a personal note to myself, I got totally jazzed when I saw the one and only Mark Lewison walk in 
and he sat down and listened in, as did Mark Lapidos, the superhero. Um, <laughs> and he was there as well, which I was like, wow, this is very cool. And uh, it was a lot of fun. The symposium was great. What uh, folks don't uh, uh, haven't been mentioned yet is that Alan actually was on three panels at the same time uh, one of the days, which was a pretty impressive feat mm. uh, on Alan's part. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> um, but it did seem that way because Alan was on a bunch of things, and I was disappointed uh, that I didn't have the opportunity to see you speak more. Uh, I was only at the uh, symposium for the one day. I know, Ken, you did two days. Mm -hmm. And Alan was there for the whole week, sleeping in his car, and uh, <laughs> almost. Uh, it was it was a really a great time, and I uh, I hope there is another one. I heard a little birdie say there may very well be one. The uh, Ken Womack is the guy behind uh, the guy behind this White Album Symposium. He is a dean at Monmouth University, as well as a Beatle author, and uh, that's where the symposium was held at Monmouth. And uh, it was a great time. And it was I was in a uh, kind of like high on the White Album for several days after yeah. because we just really sunk our teeth into the, the White Album. And Alan, um, um, sorry, not Alan, Mark Lewison's presentation on Saturday night blew my mind. Mm -hmm. And Paul Saltzman talking about the Beatles time in India uh, mm. was uh, was sweet. And it was uh, it was it was incredible. And again, we'll let you know here on things we said today if and when there is some other event similar to this if we can tell them right now yes, ne <laughs> next year uh end of september i think it's 26 27 28th at the eastman school of music in rochester there will be an abbey road symposium uh and that will be directed by john kovach I didn't know that. See, folks, that's why I listen to things we said today <laughs> to find out these things. I didn't know that. I got to go yeah. write that on my calendar when I mm. when we're done recording this. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, actually, I don't know, Alan. This this uh, Abbey Road Symposium or the one coming, you know, in '69. Oh, that passed 50 years ago. The one coming up in 2019. Any relation to Ken Womax? Are they working together on this? Do you know? You know not necessarily. Mm. I mean, I, I think he'll probably be at it. Uh, you know, in last year, there was a symposium for Pepper at University of Michigan, which mm -hmm. uh, uh, Walter Everett, I think, uh, was in charge of. So, it, it, you know, it changes. These are all academic symposiums. That, um, there were some really interestingly academic things. Aaron Krerowitz did a thing about modulation, which is the way keys change uh, in, mm -hmm. in music, and um, basically had charted all of the modulations and different kinds of modulations the Beatles use, how many songs have them, how many songs don't, what, uh, what their particular favorite kind of modulations were, and, you know, not just the White Album, although, you know, he used White Album examples uh, others were kind of fanciful um okay one of them was the beatles as the tetragrammaton the tetragrammaton is the four hebrew letters that spell god's name and uh, he's he sort of went through this thing about i can't, can't remember who actually gave this paper but it was kind of interesting you know using the four elements and the four seasons and the you know all kinds of things going back to ancient times you know of there's there's a lot of there's a lot of ways that things break down into four and so he would apply each of these categories to each of the beatles and it was it was an interesting presentation it wasn't you know um too thoroughly rooted in reality, let's say, but it was it was it was interesting. I also agree. Mark Mark Lewison's presentation was spectacular. What he did for those who weren't there is he used as his uh, sort of PowerPoint template like a diary for the period that the White Album was being recorded and in production and looked at basically every single day of what was going on with the Beatles and would you know he had icons on each date and would click on them and either play you isolations from the white album or uh you know show pictures show news clippings it was it was really well done i think he uh i think in a way he got 
so involved doing it that he exceeded his what was supposed to be his time, his announced time, by something like an hour. And that and he is, even had a rush yeah. towards to get, you know, even get it finished when he did. Oh, yeah. I really I would really crazy. I'd really like to hear the complete unexpurgated version, you know, because he did have to rush through some things at the end. He skipped some. Uh, just because the way the time was going and Paul Saltzman was talking next. So Mark was the only one who, where, you know, his talk was not up against six or seven other talks. So basically everybody, I think, you know, clearly everybody wanted to go to that. Nobody wanted to be up against him either. So um, the interesting thing about that is that it wasn't strictly the music that he was presenting. It was everything else going on in their personal lives. Right. At the same time, so it makes you aware of just how busy they were. Yeah. Well, period. Yeah, you know, that's whether, what I... whether they were visiting the United States or not, or you know, a lot of things going on. All of John and Yoko's activities with two virgins, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it, there was a lot going on there. You know, one mm-hmm. thing that I learned there that I, I'm surprised I didn't know before, but there's this photo that we've all seen before of John and Paul sitting together. And John has his head on his palm, I think it is. And and Paul's sitting right next to him, and John is kind of like smiling at him. And it's it's a, like an affectionate look between the two of them that we've all seen before. And Mark had said that was taken from when John and Paul actually sequenced all the songs from the White Album. They worked on that together, just the two of them. Mm-hmm. And I never knew it was from that. Did you? Right. No. Yeah. It's very No, not at I didn't, and that's what I found interesting. That some of the there was more than one shot from that, uh, like that uh, series of shots taken uh, at that point when John and Paul were sitting together, and to know that oh, that was during that marathon twenty-four some odd hour session where they did the sequencing of the White Album, just blew my mind. Put everything into perspective, like I've never had before, mm-hmm. never seen before, never, never, never heard before. And uh, made me, I think I said to Mark before I left, because that was at the end of the night after Paul Saltzman, and then I went over to him to say uh, goodbye. And, and I said, you know, you need to, you know, put out like a, a, a sort of like a lecture on DVD of this uh, presentation. So he got a chuckle out of that. So, you know, it was sort anyway. of white Albert mania all weekend. I mean, Thursday night, the the very first thing that I attended, really, I think there was something earlier, but. Um, was Scott Erickson playing a concert of basically the Esher demos. And among the things he played, he only played, he didn't play all of them, just a, a selection. But among the selection was What's the New Mary, Jane? And <laughs> Mark Lewis had went up to him at the end and said, you know, I, I've never heard anyone play that live. <laughs> <laughs> and then right after that was a concert by the Weaklings, which was spectacular. I mean, they did... Not all of the White Album, but they did an awful lot of it. And then some older Beatles things, and then some of their own things. And then back to the medley of uh, Side 2 of Abbey Road, and ended with Hey Jude. But they were really, really good. I I, I had never seen them live before. So um, Yeah, they're very, they're they're very cool. Yeah. 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 I wanted to ask you one quick thing, Alan, here, because on Sunday... I was part of the panel for Talk More Talk, and we had Chris Thomas as a guest. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful interview that's now online, by the way, Mm -hmm. on our Facebook page and also on YouTube. But while that was going on, one panel that I couldn't attend was yours. Right. And you were talking about Revolution Number 9, and how did that go? Right. That was a... It it wasn't really a panel so much as a solo talk, Um, and it was fun. I mean, I had a a reasonably good crowd. Uh, Mark came to mine, and Walter Everett, and a guy named Carlton Wilkinson, who had written an article about Revolution No. 9 uh, for Perspectives of New Music, which I didn't know about until the night before when we were online together waiting for Mark's talk. Um, and he handed it to me, and I wish I had time to really assimilate it because there's great stuff in it. But I, you know, I kept hoping that you know somebody would challenge me on a fact or something so that I could have my Woody Allen moment and say, "I happen to have Mark Lewis in right here," you know, <laughs> <laughs> or Walter Everett, <laughs> Carlton mm. Wilkins, there's, there's, and Tim Riley was there as well. Tim Riley had wow. also done a presentation on the art 
of the White Album, uh, with, you know, Richard Hamilton and, uh, and that whole thing, how that came about. Um, I think he did that the day before. This thing was really packed. I mean, uh, you know, you there was no period in any day when you looked at the schedule and said, "There's really nothing I want to see." I think I'll just, you know, have a coffee. There was mm. there was just always something to go to, and uh, I, I wish it wasn't quite as. Uh, quite as packed as it was you know i mean there, there didn't necessarily need to be six to eight things you know per time slot i, I think uh walter everett was telling me that when he did the sergeant pepper one last year it was one thing at a time so everybody could hear everybody else and mm. i think that probably is ideal but uh you know I, and i have no idea what they're what they're planning for the abbey road one so yeah and it was extraordinary to see most of the major Beatles authors all, all crammed together, <laughs> yeah. you know, in, in this one area here. And the talent that was there at the, in these buildings, it was just amazing. Anyway, so thanks to everyone who attended and, and those that saw our panel. And and uh, hopefully we'll maybe we'll be a part of uh, the one for Abbey Road. Who knows? Mm-hmm. All right. So let's talk about this brand new White Album box set. I've been uh, pretty much entrenched in it for uh, the last several weeks or so. Uh, I've really been listening more so to the outtakes and the demos than the remix. I must confess that I've only listened to the remix once because I've been more curious about everything else. But before I talk about my feelings about it, let's let's hear both of you, your perspectives on it. We'll start with Darren. Uh, what What for you have been the highlights? I mean, there's so many. That you can that you can talk about here, but kind of pinpoint you know a few of them. Well, uh, I would say that if you if you divided the the deluxe box up into four sections, you have discs one and two are the original album, but the original album remixed. So it's a it's a bit of a new take on the album, but for all intents and purposes the album itself is represented on the first two discs. So that would be the first section. The second section would be disc three, which is, I'm assuming all of the Easter demos. I'm pretty sure it's all the ones that exist compiled almost as if it were an album in itself. That's disc three. That's the second section. The third section is discs uh, four, five, and six, all outtakes, virtually all previously unreleased. I think there's some instances where you have material that did turn up on Anthology 3, I guess it would be. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's minuscule compared, completely dwarfed by the quantity of stuff that has never been heard before, never been issued commercially, I should say. Uh, And then the fourth and final section would be the final disc, which I have not done anything with yet. And and that's the disc of of all the different mixes, the 5.1, surround sound, etc., etc. So... You know, I have actually not had the opportunity or the time in the crazy days that have gone down over the past week or so to really sink my teeth into what I'm primarily mostly interested in. And that's the three discs of outtakes, which you just alluded to, Ken, that you're Mm -hmm. uh, mostly interested in. Uh, The Esher demos are fantastic to have, but... I don't know how many times I'll be putting that on to listen to in its entirety. And although, again, fascinating listen and great to have them all available now, as opposed to the sampling we got on the Beatles Anthology 3 album, I did ultimately feel a little skeptical about the the actual album itself now in remixed form. Uh, As I'm listening to it, I couldn't help but think to myself... "Eh." I hate to play devil's advocate here, but there's nothing wrong with it. But why did we actually need uh, another mix of the White Album when I felt like the box set really should have the definitive remastered version in stereo? I guess the 09 reissue uh, as part of the box set. There are some very minor differences in the mix, which (sighs) the value of it, I'm not quite sure. I don't really know if we needed to have this remix. I'm happy Mm. we do. But like Ken, I've only gone through it once and found myself, instead of enjoying the music, trying to figure out 
what's clearer, what's missing, what's buried for some reason in the mix, what's... I never heard that before. But when all was said and done, I thought, you know what, I really think that the standard remaster from 09 should have been here, and maybe the remix be something that gets put on the uh, the seventh disc of extra alternate mixes. Hmm. That makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Well, so, I, I can so. tell you from from only listening one time to the remix that I noticed a lot of differences. Yeah, uh, they. It, it's not drastic, but I mean, so much is clearer that um, I'm not going to say you never heard before, but certain things stand out. And especially, I mean, if, if you read if you've read every article on the remix, Ringo's drumming benefits so much from this remix. It's um, it's so much clearer to hear, and I do believe it was probably mixed up hotter. And you begin to realize, not that you didn't hear it before, but there are some things that you you weren't aware of that Ringo was playing that might have been buried before. And I think maybe it helps to make this sound even more contemporary I, you know there came a time i don't know what decade you want to go back to the 80s or whatever when drums were mixed hotter in mixes and it became the acceptable sound and i think a lot of beatles recordings suffered because she couldn't always hear what ringo was doing on beatles recordings and same thing with Paul's bass. A lot of Paul's bass playing, especially on the early records, I couldn't make out everything that he was playing. So, you know, something like this, when there's more of a separation of the instruments and you can hear more of what's actually being played without a drastic difference in the mix, there's some difference. There are some things that really stand out. And I, I feel that they were done intentionally. And I think that it sounds superb. But... You know, there's always going to be the purists out there that will say, why why change something that was perfect to begin with? I've always said, as long as the original mixes remain in print, it doesn't matter how many different mixes you come up with. If you get something out of it, if you hear something that you never heard before that fascinates you or makes you appreciate the song or what the Beatles brought to the song even more, then I'm all for it. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, we all have different opinions about this. But, um, Alan, how do you feel about the remix? Um, I like the remix if for only one thing, which is that they went back to the session masters. Um, you know, a lot of half of this album or so was done on eight track. And so for those things, you know, there wasn't a lot of generation lost during the production of the original album because they had plenty of tracks to work with. But half of it was still done on four track. And so you had reduction mixes going on, um, sometimes several in the course of a song. Every time you do a reduction mix, you're losing a little bit of quality and then you know you're you're mixing it and mastering it and the mix is going to be yet another generation by going back to the session masters and doing it in high definition digital they were basically able to make a white album using the sounds that were actually recorded not you know in first generation and in terms of the instrumental sounds, it just sounds spectacular. I mean, I think having a couple of layers of tape hiss and other artifacts stripped away makes a huge difference. Uh, I don't think that's the only reason they did this. I think they wanted to make it sound a bit more modern. There are actually, you know, really lots of differences. The end of While My Guitar Gently Weeps, there's a whole lot of vocalization from George that had been mixed out in the original mix and is now there. And you could argue, well, they mixed it out. It shouldn't be there. But you know what? I mean, like Ken says, the 2009 remaster of the 1968 mix is available. It sounds really good. This, you know, the instrumental sounds are a bit better. The vocal sounds, I don't like as much. It was the same problem I had with Pepper. The vocals sound a little bit too sharp-edged to me. But, mm. you know, it could be 
you know, if you think about this, I mean, the instrumental sound sounds so much better because we're getting right from the master tape. Why is might that not be the case with the vocal sounds? I mean, maybe the sharper vocal sounds that I'm hearing now is what it sounds like on the master. And I asked Chris Thomas that at the symposium, and he said, yeah, that's true. That's how they sounded a bit sharper. Now, Chris Thomas doesn't like the new remix very much. Um, we were on a panel together with um, Jeff Slate, Walter Everett, and Bruce Spizer was the sort of MC, uh, and he was playing us tracks and having us react, and, and Chris Thomas, generally speaking, didn't like any of them. And we got into an interesting sort of philosophical discussion of why we like or don't like what we're listening to. He didn't like it because he is thinking in terms of a record, you know, like, uh, you know, John always used to say that, you know, it's it's not just the way what they record and all that. It's, that you know, making it a good sounding record. And to Chris Thomas, the old one was a good sounding record. And the new one, I think, in a way, the clarity bothers him. And for me... I feel that, you know, by hearing the, the basically first generation audio, it's kind of like you're in the studio. So you're hearing a performance, you're sitting in the studio, but it's not like hearing a record. And it could be that where Chris Thomas and I differed is just what we want from the album. You know, I mean, I can hear the 1968 mix and hear the album, but I kind of like the feeling of sitting there in the session hearing these instruments sounding so fresh you know it could be that the yeah. you know, the vocals the old vocals sound you know warm and rounded where the new ones sound like a voice going into a microphone through an amplifier coming out of a speaker and it could be that all of that stuff that i had just said about tape copying and generation loss and tape hiss and all that that also will take the edge off of a vocal sound. So it could be that what we hear as warm and rounded and natural is actually the result of basically a flaw in the system. Huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's, I understand what you're saying. It's almost like by making this sound so perfect, it's, it's less of the original experience of what, what we heard when we first listened to it. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't hate the vocal clarity. Yeah. I, I love the vocals in particular. Yeah. I mean, that when I hear things like what really stood out for me, Revolution Number One, mm -hmm. um, I'm hearing more harmonies. I feel like I hear all of them in the studio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this right. full sound, mm -hmm. you know, that I didn't hear before. Now, maybe that's not the way the Beatles intended it. I mean, the way they intended it is the way that it first came out. So well, was it wrong to like it this way, or should we well, only think the way the Beatles wanted it? But out? there's a question there, too. Is it what they intended or what they settled for because that's what the technology available could give them? Mm. Like, how do we know if they, if they had, say, if they had the ability to put out the recordings without any generation loss, would they have objected to that? I, I don't know. I don't think so. This sounds to me a little like the, the debate that used to go down as CDs made inroads and vinyl began to die, yeah, the uh, purists pref always said, I prefer how the warmth of vinyl and uh, those who liked CDs and digital sound felt, well, that's because the vinyl was muddy and there's stuff that gets lost uh, in uh, playing a vinyl record as opposed to the clarity that you're getting with the digital, uh, with the CDs. Yeah. And then who felt, you know, their opinion was right and... And uh, you still get that digital, that sterile digital versus warm vinyl debate today as vinyl yeah. makes its way back. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I detected in listening to the, re the remix that there were occasions, uh, and I'm trying to remember what song was the most obvious example. And I think that it also was something I thought I detected with the Pepper uh, remix from last year was a sense of studio ambiance you're picking up. You're picking up the vocal, not only going into the mic, but also as it bounced off the walls in the studio that I didn't hear on on the actual album itself that was, you know, removed. 
I don't know if, uh, if you know what I'm saying. I think, heard I, that on the- I think Giles mm-hmm. added a bit of reverb here and there. I mean, if you listen to the new year blues versus the old yes. year blues, you know, John's got a bunch of reverb that he didn't used to have. There's uh-huh. another thing, you know, Ringo and the blisters on his fingers is mixed, mixed much lower on the new one than it was That's on right. the old one. And so, what's the reasoning that, that, for that? What's the reasoning for that? I don't that, know. You know, it, it, it just, I guess they were just making a, a new mix and not trying to necessarily do a recreation of exactly the old mix. You know, it's, it's just a, you know, a mix is a performance and this is their performance as opposed to Ken Scott's performance and et cetera. It's, mm. And, and, you know, yes, it's true that the Beatles were present in 1968 and approved them all. Two of the Beatles have to approve these. Uh, so it's it's not as if it just goes out with nobody involved saying, yeah, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, in terms of the new mix, I probably did this in the last show we did before the symposium, and I did it a lot at the symposium, but I found the 5.1 mix such a killer that, like, that to me is the go-to version now. Um, mm. because you are just totally surrounded by it. I mean, it starts a little slow. Back in the USSR, I just sort of shrugged and said, well, I mean, talk about a conservative mix. It doesn't really do much. But as it went on, you know, it just is incredible. I mean, on Helter Skelter and Happiness is a Warm Gun, those backing vocals always come from the back speakers. And even something like, I mean... I'm still knocked out by why don't we do it in the road, which to me was never really much of a track. But when you listen to it in 5.1, you've got this sort of arpeggiated guitar line and the piano and the drum and Paul's vocals, which are incredible. And it's just all around you. And it just sounds like such an incredible texture that's so far beyond what you hear in the regular stereo mix. Um, mm. And that's just that track. I mean, While by Guitar Gently Weeps is incredible. Um, everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey. The, the, the loud rockers really are pretty incredible in 5.1 because those are very busy tracks. And mm-hmm. the 5.1 gives you really so much clarity. It's, you know, it's not gimmicky. It's not like, oh, yeah, there's the drums in that corner and the bass in that corner. It's just, it's really well mixed, but um, yet you are, you know, sitting right in the middle of this torrent of sound. And I, I put on Pepper again, you know, the 5.1 mix of Pepper, and it wasn't really quite so powerful. I was a little surprised in a way. Uh, well, how much, Alan? How much of of the White Album percentage, roughly, guess a guesstimate, was done on eight track as opposed to four? It's you, roughly half, I think. Um, now, could we? Could we? Uh, I mean, could you be hearing the fact that you're listening to a modern remix of eight track recordings versus all of Pepper being done on four? And you just is you just so much that can be done when you've got that much, you know, those few tracks. It's possible. It's very possible, except for one thing. They weren't using just the four track mix down for Pepper. They went back to the individual components before the um, uh, what, what do they call it? Those intermediate mixes. You mix know, downs? Yeah, the intermediate mix downs, or the reduction mixes, they were called. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when they, what they had for Pepper was, you know, if they recorded four tracks and then they mixed three of them down to one on the next tape so that they had three spare tracks, they still have those original tapes of the original separate four tracks, and they've uh-huh. transferred all of that to digital. So for what they have for Pepper now is beyond an eight-track tape. So they really could have done, I don't know, the same thing. It, it's, it's just, I don't know, I think, the, I think the White Album has also a lot more powerful stuff in a way. I wouldn't have thought that until I heard this. Um, you know, for me, Pepper was sort of the peak in a way, and now, now I listen to this, and I don't think that at all. So, yeah, um, 
it's it, it, this is also just really the the best five point one mix of anything I've ever heard, you know. And I've got wow. a lot. I've got a lot of them sitting around here, you know. Mark Lewison was doing some research in Boston, so he drove up, and um, we spent uh, the weekend, a long weekend, and listened to the 5.1 mix a number of times, and then went back to Pepper, and then went to some of my other 5.1 things, and nothing came close to this, you know. Mm. It, it really is, is a spectacular job, and... Uh, like I say, I, I, I don't know if it will, will really always be my go-to because it's a bit of a pain in the butt to set up 5.1 sometimes. You need your TV screen to be the menu and all that stuff, but um, it's kind of worth it. And also, when you hear things isolated, you can hear everything. So, um, you know, you were even talking about at the symposium, Piggies. Mm-hmm. In 5.1, and that you can hear Paul's bass playing, and it almost sounds like he's grunting like a pig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's something I never noticed on the old stereo version. But you know, the it it's so present now. The bass is also mixed higher, so you know you can you can hear that. And uh, so a lot of nice touches that the remix, either in in stereo or in 5.1, reveal. Um, you know what I wanted to bring up was one particular song, because on Long, 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 one of the things that I noticed that really stood out, and everybody's talking about Ringo's drums on Long, 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 which are spectacular, but they really mixed up George's vocals. Mm-hmm. And in particular, that first verse, where you're used to George's voice being really soft, they pushed it up a bit. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, somebody had asked at the symposium, why did they follow Helter Skelter with something as quiet as Long, Long, Long with an introduction so quiet? And I I think, although we don't know for certain, but just to show the contrast of going from something as loud and powerful as Helter Skelter into something so quiet as Long, Long, Long. Right. And yet here, George's vocals are boosted up, whereas it was so soft to begin with. You know, it may have disturbed some people when they first listened to Long, 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 how quiet that beginning is. Yeah. And so this changes things a bit. It's like moving from Revolution 9 to Good Night. You know, the the, the contrasts are really stark. On the Isher demos, something I wanted to point out. We've had the Isher demos since the 90s, right? We've had 23 of the 27. Mm -hmm. and. We got them ultimately from John Lennon's mono cassette that was made for him, you know, after these were all finished. Uh, It may have been made as a reel and he transferred it to a cassette. I don't know. But what we had was mono. When the anthology came out, it was clear that George had the stereo or it may even be four track. I don't know uh, what his equipment was, but he had at least a stereo mix of it that was going to be notably superior you know a generation or so less at least mm-hmm. uh but it turns out that the Esher demos in stereo are not exactly the same as the Esher demos in mono that we had i mean there are there are bits in between the tracks that are on john's tape that they didn't put on this one and there are even some you know, overdubs and some talking during the songs that you heard on John's tape, but you didn't hear on these. And someone has, as you would expect, already made a version that brings both versions together. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's called Kinfon's Revisited. It's out there on the internet. I'm sure everybody with, you know, any resources can find it. And, uh, you know, it's like that now, in a way, becomes the definitive Esher tape because it gives us everything that's on the new one plus the bits from John's tape that were that are now missing from the official one. Mm. <laughs> it never stops, does it? <laughs> <laughs> no. As I'm listening to you guys talk and I'm thinking about what I said uh, at the top of our White Album discussion about you know my my skepticism about the nece- how it, how necessary uh the remix was and um i'm realizing that the very first time i listened i listened to the 3 disc edition i didn't listen to the box set and what i was craving as i was listening to the 3 disc edition was the outtakes mm-hmm. and the 3 disc edition does not include the outtakes 
which I the more and more I think about it, especially now as we're having this discussion, I'm thinking the people who the folks who buy the three disc edition are really missing out Mm -hmm. on what is the treasure, in my opinion, of the box set. And that's the three discs of unreleased outtakes Mm -hmm. to get the three disc set where you're getting the white album, but the remix and the Easter demos and nothing, nothing else. Just feeling that, you know, I wanted more. And two thirds of this three disc set is what I know already with subtle changes. Mm -hmm. So I think that my opinion might, uh, my opinion, my negative opinion of the the remix may have come from that. And now as I'm hearing you guys take a different perspective, I'm like, no, I don't want it to be known that I don't like the, the, the remix. I do. And I'm glad it was done. Just that my initial impression was that this is two thirds of this long awaited set. And, you know, where's the beef? <laughs> right. Uh, but, the, you know, and I, and I strongly urge everyone listening, the way to go with this is to go with the big box set. Getting the three disc is uh, almost like a tease, but you need to go for the, the gusto here because to hear the whole thing, to hear the original album in a new light to, with all of the outtakes and the demos, that's the true way to go with this. If you're going all out, if you if you're going, you know, you got to go with the the box set. Um, well, well, the box set is more designed for people like us and for the more hardcore fans who, you know, want to hear different takes and hear the development of songs, and it interests those people, those kind of fans. I think the the three disc set that you mentioned with just the Easter demos and the remix. That's more for the casual fan, for the new Beatle fan that's out there. But should the and new Beatle fan, shouldn't the new Beatle fan just go then to the 2009 CD? You know yeah, only, only the fact is that, you know, they're doing this for the 50th anniversary. If you want to honor that, listen to a new remix that sounds, you know, to some ears, more contemporary sounding. Plus you get one extra disc of demos. Demos are a big attraction these days, I think for a lot of people, just to hear how songs started out in the very beginning. But it's real difficult to, you know, if you're going to make different variations, which they do in every single one of these archive series, you got to have one that's more catering towards the casual and one that's more for the for the hardcore. And that's how it is with all the McCartney archived uh, releases, and that's how it was for the Imagine one. You know, that's that's just the way that it's, that it's been designed. Right, right. Yeah, I, so my opinion would probably formed and now i'm going to try to you know kind of change my my thinking a little bit formed because the first time i listened to a 50th anniversary edition it was listening to the three disc and not getting what i knew was that out there in the box set and that's all of the outtakes right. spread out three cds that's a lot of outtakes and you and- can't expect a, a new fan or a casual fan to want to shell out whatever it is 149 dollars or more for a box set <laughs> no, that, you're that's right. quite a, quite a lot. So, but then, I, but then again, I would feel like the casual fan who's not willing to spend that really should concentrate on the original mix of the album, which is available on the what is now an old <laughs> 2009 CD release. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and the remix is kind of more for the hardcore fan, maybe the second tier hardcore fan. We're going to divide fandom into all these different subdivisions. <laughs> Um, but in any event, and then I was, of, of course, uh, analyzing this three CD packaging, you know, I would have liked a little three by five photographs of the four individual, uh, pictures that were eight by tens on the original album. But anyway, uh, just a little esoteric point there mm-hmm. about uh, packaging, but yeah, the gold is in those three discs of outtakes in my book. Uh, the one thing I would add about the Easter demos, I think, um, whether you're hearing it within the context of the seven disc box or the three CD version, is that um, you know I, I think ever since uh, MTV Unplugged, you know, was out, uh, people were fascinated with sort of unplugged performances of of songs they know as electric, and with the Easter demos, you're getting. You're getting something that is halfway between an MTV unplugged performance by the Beatles, which in itself has a certain amount of charm, and 
the Beach Boys party, <laughs> which, you know, it, it has a lot of that atmosphere, you know. I mean, there's a couple of the songs, you know, the Esher demos are we don't really even totally know what they were, you know, some of them, George's songs seem to have been done by him on his own. Some of Paul's songs seem to be him on his own, but others don't. And then things like, um, revolution, you know, they're, they're, they're clapping and singing along. So that's clearly mm-hmm. done when they were all together. So, uh, yeah. Bungalow Bell is like that too. Bungalow Bell. Yeah. So there, there is that kind of party atmosphere and, uh, it plays into what, you know, in, in my, I reviewed the album for the wall street journal. And one of the things I was talking about is how many agendas are going on in this reissue. And Giles Martin's agenda, which I guess we should talk about either this week or next week, uh, it's up to you guys, but um, his agenda is about showing that the Beatles really were having a great time during the White Album and not, as legend has it, the start of the breakup. And there's an awful lot to debate about that, so maybe we should save it. But I think, in terms of what I was saying about the Esher demos, that that is part of what informs that um that argument of his that you know there it, it it does sound like they're having such a good time just sitting there playing these songs and you know they never did that before i mean they made some demos but they were individual demos done you know on their own one at a time you know sometimes with a couple of Beatles on it, but, uh, you know, they never sat down and recorded 27 demos. It's just, you know, it's just a completely unique kind of thing. And by the way, there may not be just 27. Um, It's very possible that they chose 27 because the word out there has been that there were 27, but there may be a couple more. Um, I'm not sure why people believe that um but some people who are pretty well connected and really know this stuff seem to believe it so i'll just put that out there and if um any information comes our way that will be handy seem to believe that there are more Mm -hmm. does anyone put a number on what the possible how many more tracks might actually exist uh no i don't think an immense amount more but you know, a few others, I think. What I found interesting about the Isha demos, but these were the observations I made when I heard them for the first time, and I don't recall when that was. I don't I don't recall, but the amount of time that they spent to make a demo with overdubs, mm-hmm. you know, double track vocals. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas a demo, you figure you hit play and record, strum the tune on an acoustic, do the song, and that's the demo. Mm-hmm. But uh, the fun part of the Easter demos is, is the extra work that they put into these. Uh, almost like, in some instances, it almost sounds like they knew in 50 years. This could <laughs> be an album itself. Yes. So let me do double tracking now while I've got my new, shiny new four track or, uh, you know, cassette recorder or reel to reel machine uh, and uh, make a kind of elaborate demo. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the Isha demos, for folks listening, just in a, take a second. They're called the Isha demos not because they necessarily were all recorded at George's house, but because all of the tapes, stuff that might have been done at Paul's house by Paul alone or John's place by himself, everything ended up getting compiled together at George's place in one... Am I understanding that correctly? That ended yeah. up being... The home base for the physical tapes. And do we know that if everything was spooled together, like is there one reel or are they uh, all individual tapes in a box somewhere in, in, uh, you know, stored in Esher and George's attic somewhere? Or do we know the specifics of that? Um, I think he probably made a reel because if he copied it for John, I can't see him doing it one tape at a time, you know, for 20 on John's has 23, but for 23 tapes, they probably compiled them into a reel. And they had intended to rehearse a bit more uh, before going in to record the the, the album. And the Esher session, let's call it, 
was basically the only day that they did get together to rehearse. Um, and we now may have a date for it, by the way. As, as you notice that um, in his talk, uh, Mark Lewison ascribed it to May 27th. And during on May 27th, if that's the date, what took place? Did they all listen together to everything they had recorded and started? Uh... Well, the time that they got together at Esher with all these demos, either finishing recording them or bringing them along, compiling them, whatever it was, right. seems to have been May 27th, according to Mark Lewison. But he didn't say what his reasoning was. But that left only three more days before the sessions began. And um, they had intended to do some more rehearsal. I mean, Paul says that in, in some interviews. Um, he says we, we expected to rehearse these, spend several days rehearsing these, but in the end we only got one day. So the one day we know of is when they were at Isha. Hmm, wow. And maybe that day they did other numbers besides the 27th. Possibly. See, the thing is that not everything on the White Album was written in Rishikesh or even necessarily before the White Album sessions began. Some of them were, were written since. Um, so the only things they could have done at Esher were things they already had by then, obviously, and probably mostly the things that they did in Rishikesh. And so there are some missing, like, you know, Good Night, for instance. There's no Isha demo of Good Night, but it was written in Rishikesh. So there could conceivably have been one, and we now know from the outtakes, you know, on the, those last three discs on the set, that Good Night underwent a, a little bit of a transformation. It didn't start out as a big orchestral thing. You know, it started out with, you know, guitar and backing vocals. And uh, so conceivably they could have done a niche or demo for it. And that could be number 28, so far as we know. Just don't, mm -hmm. just don't know, you know, until Livia invites us all over and says, oh, just go rummaging through the. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't get her invite? No, I didn't. <laughs> Oh, I got, maybe I shouldn't say, I got mine in the mail yesterday. No, I'm just kidding. Well, I, I'll, I'll tag along and hold the, <laughs> the pad, you know. <laughs> it just goes to show you we'll never get to know everything there is to know about the Beatles. There's always something that we're discovering. It could happen at any time, really. Mm -hmm. But for me, the Easter demos are fascinating. And to listen to them all on one disc, the fact that you can fit all 27 on one disc, it's really uh, delightful to listen to. For me, it's always interesting with any song, if you're used to hearing an electric uh, accompaniment to a song and then you hear it stripped down to acoustic, it always has a different feel to it, a different vibe to it altogether. And, um, you know, when you're hearing something like back in the USSR on acoustic guitar, when you're used to hearing electric, you know, throughout, then it has a different feel. There's so many songs you could say that about. And you also get to notice that when they made these demos, many of these songs weren't finished. Not all the lyrics were fully developed. Right. A song like Back in the USSR was missing a verse. Um, so was you Revolution. Also, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it's also interesting, even though you, know, you can go all the way back to the Beatles anthology when it was put on there, Happiness is a Warm Gun was missing the chorus. It was missing the, the opening, that first verse. It just had those two sections, I Need a Fix and the Mother Superior part. Mm -hmm. And that's all that John had. And that was a demo. And then if you listen to something like the demo for I'm So Tired, at the very end, he's doing this big ad lib, you know, what I hold you in my arms, which he then used later on, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and happiness is a warm gun. Yep. So, but, and I love those ad libs from John at the end of I'm So Tired and Dear Prudence, where he's, you know, telling the story of Prudence Farrow at the very end, I found really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Glass Onion is not finished as a song. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's missing a verse. You know, the, there's so many things you learn from this. Also, you know, which songs they wrote earlier, which ones you would think have to have been written after the Isher demos. Although, from what you're saying, Alan, it may not be. We'll learn more about that, hopefully, as we go along here. Because mm -hmm. certain songs that were not on the Isher demos, I would think, like Birthday, like Savoy Truffle, you know, those had to have been written later. Yeah. Well, Birthday uh, certainly was. 
And then you've got these other songs like um, Not Guilty and, and Circles, songs that George eventually released in his solo career. Child of Nature became Jealous Guy for Imagine. Junk was released by Paul on his first solo album. You've got those. You've got the two songs that ended up on Abbey Road with me, Mr. Mustard, and Polythene Pam. Mm -hmm. Did they write anything else at that time that ended up on Abbey Road? I don't know. You listen to these um, outtakes, and there's an early take of Let It Be that early on. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, we're still discovering. We're still learning. And we're still we're going to probably now end up with uh, a catch all part two of the White Album for our next show. That was an excellent follow up, Darren. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that uh, what we will do is um, put this this particular show to a close here. Next show, we will follow up and just talk about the outtakes on the three discs. Sounds good. That sounds like, yeah, and and I think it's important to do it that way. The, um, because it allows us to give more time. Like I said, like we've been saying, I think, in a nutshell, there's a lot on this box set, and trying to get it down in one conversation is kind of hard. And I bet you our, some of our opinions might even be different in a couple of weeks when you listen to the next show. And that so. could happen. And by the time we fully absorbed all these discs, then McCartney's new archive collection will come out, <laughs> and we'll have more to listen to. All right. So, and we've got some authors uh, coming up and uh, that we're going to be talking with. So lots of fun-filled, packed episodes ahead on things we said today. <laughs> Indeed. So why don't we just very quickly give the folks our contact information, starting with you, Darren. All right. You can uh, uh, reach out to me at my WFUV email address, uh, which is my full name, Darren DeVivo. D A R R E N D E V I V O at W F U V dot org. And um, you can also go to Facebook and like my radio page, Darren DeVivo on W F U V radio is the one you want. Click like and then we'll be in touch and feel free to send messages and whatnot. I'm, I think I'm pretty good about getting back to people there on, on the radio page. Okay. Alan, how about you? Okay, the easiest way to get in contact with me is just go on Facebook, where I have an Alan Cozen page and an Alan Cozen remix page. Maybe the remix discussion should be on the remixed page. <laughs> Why don't you have a demo page? <laughs> I might. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and as for me, Ken Michaels, you can always email me at everylittlething at att.net. My website is KenMichaelsRadio.com. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing one of the guests at the symposium, and that was Ken Mansfield, who is the former U.S. manager for the Beatles' Apple Records. And he has a brand new book, which has just been released, called The Roof, The Beatles' Final Concert. And I talked to him about his career with the Beatles, everything leading up to working for Apple Records and being on the rooftop, which he was. Um, and that can be found on interviews page four of my website. And don't forget, there's always Beatles trivia and games every single week where you can win one of nine great prizes like Egypt Station or the Imagine uh, 2 CD set that's out there. And if you want to get in touch with us here at the show, our email address is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We have a Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today Radio Fans. And um, Alan, our Twitter address is? Our Twitter address is at Things We Said Fab. All right. This has been a great discussion, talking about the White Album, and we shall resume it in our next show, talking about those outtakes of the, uh, of the box set. So... For Alan Cozen and Darren DeVivo, this is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening, and we will see you next time. Take care.